Go with me to Acts chapter 1 today. Acts chapter 1. I want to look at verses 15 through 26. Acts chapter 1. We'll start at verse number 15. We'll land at verse 26. By the way, my name is Robert Madu. My wife and I have the privilege of pastoring this awesome church. She's right here on the front row. Usually we, uh, usually we say what's up, but just in case you didn't know, I heard there's also some people from People's Church. Where y'all at? They say y'all took up like two rows. Come on, Oklahoma in the house. Glad to have y'all here. Acts chapter one, start at verse number 15. When you're ready to read it, say yeah. If you're not ready and you need some time and your feet hurt, say, hold on. I heard that. But you wore those shoes, so. <laughs> Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 15, and it says, In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas. You have to say the original hater's name like that. <laughs> who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. And there he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Peter, you ain't got to give us all those details. My goodness. And everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language a keldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. In other words, the betrayal had already been prophesied. It had already been written that the betrayal was going to happen. And he said, may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So, they nominated two men. Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Can you say amen? amen? Very interesting passage of scripture uh, that I believe the Holy Spirit has orchestrated this moment for you to hear this message today. How many know you're not here by accident? Yeah. You're here by God's divine providence. Watch it on YouTube, on the replay. You're supposed to watch this. Click past the ad, keep watching. I want to talk to you today using this as a title, PR Problems, PR Problems. And hopefully by the end of this, we'll make it make sense. Look at your neighbor for the last time and just say, neighbor, neighbor. You, gotta you gotta deal with PR problems. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words. Speak to our hearts today. Let us leave different than the way that we came in. Let the word of God come alive today. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Come on, everybody said. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. PR problems. Sometimes I wonder if the writers of the Bible were low-key trying to gaslight the people that they were writing about. Sometimes you read scripture and you miss out on the comedy in the scripture. And don't worry, that's why I'm here for you today. Did y'all read what we just read? It, it, it's verse 23 for me. Verse 23 is what messes me up. Because understand that this is 
the first election before the birth of the New Testament church. It's the first election. Peter has called this election. And I want you to see in verse number 23, here's the two candidates for the midterm election. Um, so they nominated two men. Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. The dude that wins the election is Matthias. That's the one who won. The dude who lost just happens to be nicknamed Justice. <laughs> How in the world <laughs> you gonna be called Justice and you lose the first election? Somebody should have gave this brother another name. <laughs> I want justice for justice. I just want to say that at the onset of this sermon. That, that was his nickname. The Bible happened to tell us that. While we're on topic, anybody in here, do you have a nickname that you are called but you can't stand? Can I see your hand? You got a nickname that you are still called but you can't stand. Isn't that annoying? Come on. You, you 38 years old, three kids, and they still at Thanksgiving. Talking about, come on, Pookie, come get, <laughs> come get another plate. You're like, I'm grown. It's frustrating to have a nickname uh, especially if it doesn't line up with you. And I'm going to give you mine today. I, I have a nickname. I have a nickname uh, that only my family calls me, and they still call me to this day. Now, before I give you this nickname, let me just say right now that if you call me this nickname, trying to be funny after service, just leave our church, okay? Just <laughs> find you another place to worship. But I have a nickname. First of all, my full legal name, my full legal name is Robert Naji Tichala Madu, okay? That's my full name. I'm playing. And Dichala's not in there. <laughs> Somebody was like, for real? <laughs> no, but my full name is Robert Naji Madu, okay? I am the second. But my dad's name is Robert Naji Madu, of course. So they had to give me a name to make the clear distinction between the both of us. So here's the name of all the nicknames, Bob, Bob, okay? That's, that's what my family still calls me today, Bob, Bob, don't you dare. Don't even think about it. I see you thinking about it. Don't call me Bob. And I perpetuated this because I named my son after me. He's Robert Naji Madu III. <laughs> and I call him Bubba. Bubba. <laughs> Arkansas name and he looked Puerto Rican. Just all, <laughs> all messed up. So nicknames are funny, and, and there's, there's a, a new nickname that I've acquired recently since we planted this church. In fact, I got one, and Taylor got one, and I actually love this nickname. This one is amazing. You can call me this one all day, every day, because it's actually endearing, and that is PR and PT. PR and PT. That's what they call us, PR and PT, okay? Pastor Robert, Pastor Taylor, I love that, okay? Maybe when I turn 60, call me Bishop or Chief Apostle or Archbishop. But for right now, I like PR and PT. It stands for Pastor Robert and for Pastor Taylor. And I love these nicknames. I love these monikers because they're actually, who covertly who, clues to our unique personalities, our unique idiosyncrasies, because we are completely different. I am different than that woman right there. She is PT, and of course she's PT. She has to be PT. She is who? Enneagram 7. She has never met a human or an animal that she doesn't love, okay? Southern hospitality, PT. And the reason she's PT is not just Pastor Taylor. It's not just Pastor Taylor. It's because 99.9% .9 of the time what is on her mind is party time. She is party time. She's like, ah! <laughs> Turn up. She's always about a party. She's always about bringing people over. She is party time. Now, don't get this sermon twisted. I don't want you to think I'm boring. Don't have me out here in these streets. I'm not boring. I'm not boring. I like to turn up. I like to turn up. I like to have a good time. I like to have fun, but I am not PT. I am PR. I'm PR. I'm all about the turn up, Woo, but I'm, I'm, I'm public relations, okay? I'm like, let's think about this. Let's think about the full extent of the turn up before we turn all the way up. I'm Enneagram 5 investigator. I'm like, let's thoroughly think this thing through before we go all the way with it. I am PR, public relations. This came into play uh, last week, last week, I guess a couple weeks ago, because we had a party. We had a Christ-centered party at our house. A Christ-centered party at our house that just happened to be on October 31st, okay? And uh, we had food and we dressed up and because she's PT, she's like, yeah, the more the merry. I'm like, okay, we can have a party. And I know, and you know, that no day belongs to the devil. Every day is the Lord's day. I know that. 
that, okay? Every day is the Lord's Day. I also know that a lot of our holidays have pagan origins. So if you don't start tripping about that, you got to get rid of every single holiday and take your Christmas tree down. But that's another time for another day. But anyway, I said if we're going to have the party, PT, let's whoo, not post the party. Let's not post a picture of us in the costumes because whoo, I'm public relations, okay? Let's not post it because people on the internet are crazy. Oh, but she didn't listen because she's PT. It's not just Pastor Taylor, not just party time. PT is also post that, post that. So she posts, she posts a picture of our family. That's, that's our family right there, okay? That, that, that's the picture, that's the picture. I said, oh, don't post that, don't post that. Why would you post that? And she posted that picture, and right after she posted that picture, whoo, I knew it was coming, because I'm PR. The comments started hitting that picture. Can I read a couple of them? These are just a few. Here's the first one. It's a hard unfollow for me. Hard unfollow for me, lost follower from that picture. Here's another one right here. This one says, pray for them and the many other believers. Lukewarm, lukewarm. That was another one. This is another one right here. Put, put that one up. Ooh, yes, yes, I love this. We wonder why Christians are going to hell. It's the blind leading the blind. It's about 68,000 more comments where that came from. I said, see, I told you. <laughs> PR, I knew that was coming. Not only that, before the party, I don't know if you knew who she was from that picture. I was asking her, I said, who are you going to dress up as? Who are you going to dress up as? She said, I'm going to dress up as my hero. I said, babe, hold up. Do not dress up as me, okay? We will for real get canceled if you dress up as me. Don't do that. I know I'm your hero. She's like, no, you ain't my hero. I said, oh, okay, that hurts. Um, I said, who is your hero? She said, Joyce Meyer, Joyce Meyer, Battlefield of the Mind, Joyce Meyer is my hero. That's why I'm dressed up. I said, absolutely not. Don't dress up. We don't know Joyce like that. We don't know Joyce at all. She doesn't know that you're giving her honor. What if she thinks you're making fun of her and she comes after her? She's been in the Christian game a long time. She might have goons. I don't know how she is in these streets. I said, don't do it. Don't do it. But she's PT. She's going to do what she wants. Post that. Can you show the picture of her dressed up? That, that's her. Dressed up like Joyce Meyer. I said, why? I said, this woman is going to follow us and say something. Sure enough, social fam, sure enough, right after that picture, a few days later, all of a sudden, this pops up on the ground. Oh, you're cheering. I was scared to death. I said, here it goes. She's aware of the post. All of a sudden, I look, and I'm nervous, I'm sweating, but then she comments, and here's what Joyce comments. Ah, get it, at Taylor Madu, this is amazing. Comments on my page, this is amazing, you all are awesome. All I have to say is your kids look amazing too. I'm like, I know, we made them. <laughs> and I was so excited, and I told her, I'm glad you dressed up as Joyce. See, I told you you should dress up <laughs> as her. And I found that week, quite intriguing because within a span of a few days I went from it's a hard unfollow for me to Joyce Meyer following me I went from the pain of social media rejection somebody unfollowed me because of that picture but also a few days later to uh Affirmation, self-adulation, low-key snobbery, <laughs> low-key, because Joyce got 4.2 million followers. She only followed 97, and one of the 97 is... <laughs> and I was, I was blown away from the feeling that I experienced from being unfollowed and called the blind leading the blind and the feeling of being followed and being told that my kids were cute. It, it's those two emotions within a span of the few days that were really the impetus of this sermon today because what I was wrestling with is something that you're probably wrestling with and I titled it the message, PR problems. PR problems. I'm telling you right now, 
Your life is being heavily affected and influenced, whether you realize it or not, by a PR problem, by how you respond to a PR problem. Whether you realize it or not, your finances are being affected by a PR problem. Some of you don't even know your business is being influenced by your response and your reaction to a PR problem. Some of you don't even know that most of the relationships in your life right now are being heavily influenced by a PR problem, your response to the PR problem. What, what is the PR problem? Oh, it's not public relations. When I say PR, I'm talking about praise and rejection. Praise and rejection. How you respond to the, it's a hard unfollow, and how you respond to the, you are amazing, and your kids are amazing too, will shape the trajectory of your life. How you respond to the praise of other people and the rejection of other people will influence your life more than you realize it or not. In fact, bring out my PR department because you know it's a big room. I want to make sure you have a visual. Give them a hand as they come out real quick. Yeah. Y'all could do better than that. Come on, they got to carry these signs a long time. <laughs> PR problem. Not Pastor Robert. Praise and rejection. And most of us are living within the tension of these two realities. Pray. How you respond to the praise of other people and how you respond to the rejection of other people. And what I find intriguing about these two different things is that they're on opposite ends of the continuum, yet they are inextricably and intimately connected. Oh yes, praise from people and rejection from other people. Oh, they are so connected. As a matter of fact, the reason this hurts so much is because I crave this so much. In fact, the reason many of us are dying because of this is because we live for this. And you got to be careful when you go through life because as you go through life, please believe you will get a lot of praise. You will get a lot of accolades. You will get a lot of support. And when you go through life, please believe me, you will face some rejection. You will face real rejection sometimes from the people that you need praise from the most. And the challenge of these two extremities is to not let the praise go to my head and create pride in my life and to not let the rejection go to my heart so I never reach out to have significant relationships again and if all of us are honest in this place we are all wrestling between the extremity of praise from people and rejection from other people the trap of praise and the pain of rejection. Let's just play with praise for a minute. Come over here, praise. In fact, can I divide the room? Is that cool? I, I want to divide the room right down the middle, and I want this to be the praise side. I'll take those golf claps. And this will be the rejection side. Oh, y'all looked at my notes. That's exactly what I wanted you to do. Praise is a peculiar poison. Because the reality is all of us are neurobiologically hardwired for connection. Oh, we need connection. Not only do we need connection, we need validation and we need affirmation from other people. You can't tell me, I don't care what nobody thinks. Please. Please. I don't care what nobody thinks about me. For real. I know you care what other people look, think about you just by the way you look right now. Come on. If you really didn't care, you would have just woke up out the bed today and walk straight to church the way you know you don't look like right now how you look when you looked up when you woke up come on somebody be real be real you might not be gucci down to the socks but you did something you combed your hair you brushed your teeth we all care to a degree so away with this notion i don't care what anybody thinks about me that is not true we were wired for affirmation we were wired for validation we need it as a matter of fact you don't even know you're great until somebody tells you you're great Every person that you know, no matter what their craft is, somebody had to tell them they were great first. They didn't know. They just started singing. They're like, ooh, Beyonce, we didn't know you had that. They just started doing something. They just painted something. They didn't know. They were just painting. And all of a sudden, somebody stood back and said, Picasso? I didn't know. 
So we need validation. We need the approval. The problem is, if I receive it and I become addicted to it, if I can't live without it, it's okay to receive it, but what happens when the thing you receive becomes the thing you can't live without? And you have to have it and you die without it. Y'all the praise section, right? Praise. Can you make some noise real quick? Praise. <laughs> praise. I think you got more than that. Come on, praise. That's humanity right there. Stop. No, no, come on, please, please, please. That is the human plight. We love praise. I had you make that noise and I had this emoticon be the clap because to me, the clap of humanity is the original trap music. Oh, I'm you gotta be careful what people clap for because whatever they clap for, you will repeat the behavior that you are celebrated for. That's why some of y'all post what you post. <laughs> you posting it because that's the only thing that gets the likes. That's the only thing that gets the comments. And even if inwardly you want to post the last eight books you read, even if inwardly you want to post the profound thing that came to your head, that God spoke to your spirit, you ain't posting that. You got to post the thirst trap because whatever gets rewarded gets celebrated. That's why you got to be careful what you get a clap for. Sell a Brady because it becomes your cell. It becomes my prison. That's why I have to be careful every time I preach a message because if I'm not careful, I'll start preaching for you to say, oh, he killed it today. Oh, it was another good one today. Not knowing that I am preaching for an audience of one. That I could get off this stage. And if every one of y'all said that was horrible and booed me on the way out, as long as he was pleased with what I preached, as long as I can walk away from this pulpit knowing I said what he wanted me to say, that is the fight of my life. The fight of my life is to live for an audience of one and to not let what I'm celebrated for become a cell that imprisons me. What is it about us that keeps doing what we get celebrated for? That's why some of y'all are grown and on your birthday you still post your cash app. <laughs> I'm not hating, do you? <laughs> but you know why? Because what gets rewarded gets celebrated. And you, you were a kid and you had your little money clip. <laughs> That's the adult version, Cash App. You just posted on your page. That's the adult version of the kid that said, it's my birthday, give me some money. And they got the clip. I'm like, what did you do? Like, what, what did you do? You were just born. <laughs> you did not contribute to your birth. Your actual birth is like your spiritual birth. You know you did not contribute to your physical birth and you did not contribute to your spiritual birth. That was a work of Jesus. The only thing you contributed to your spiritual birth is the sin that made the death of Jesus necessary. But you didn't contribute anything to it. It's like your natural birth. You just were born. Because since your first birthday, somebody put a cake in front of your face. <laughs> People have become addicted to praise. And I came to tell you, you can receive it. Oh, you can receive it. But if your soul needs it, you will die from it. Humanity was not created to get glory. We were created to reflect glory. We were not created to receive it. Bob Mumford, the brilliant author, said that praise is food for God, but poison for man. It is food for God, but poison for man. Billy Graham said, you're not more like Satan, except for the moments that you have to get the credit. Anytime there's something in you that has to get the credit, they better see me. You ever see the people leave a church? Yeah, they didn't see my value go start my own ministry. Now, no, no, y'all don't, don't know who I am. Y'all don't see my value. You didn't see how many likes this video got. Nobody sees my value. I'm going to start my own thing because it is a slippery slope when your soul needs the praise. Ooh, I wish I could come down there. I really do. I'm tempted to jump. 
do, do you know what? Somebody said no. <laughs> do, do you know? Um, do you know? Y- y'all good? Your arms hurt. You, you know? Uh, praise. Make some praise. I'm coming to you in a minute. You know what I did when I turned 21? My dad's here. I'm gonna tell the story. You, you, you know what I did when I turned 21? I went to a liquor store when I turned 21. Went to a liquor store and I bought my first bottle of liquor when I was 21. And I'll never forget it. Walked in, bought the liquor, uh, came home, and uh, poured all the alcohol out. Rinsed the bottle real good. Took the label off the bottle. Filled the bottle with apple juice. Put it in a brown paper bag. Actually, before the brown paper bag, I put a label, a new label, on the bottle, walked into church with the bottle, and I preached a message. What y'all think I was gonna say? I've been, I'm a church kid. <laughs> I'm saved, been saved a long time. <laughs> and I preached a message, and I brought the bottle out in front of the whole church. I wish this was still on YouTube. I said, church, I have a confession to make today. I said, I'm addicted to this bottle. I said, every single day, I find myself going to this bottle. I said, church, I am embarrassed to admit to you that the times I've gone to this bottle the most has been after I finished ministry and finished preaching. The whole church was like. (laughs) And I said, I know y'all know what I'm talking about today because it starts with an A and it ends with the L. And I pulled it out of the bag and it didn't say Jack Daniels or anything on the front. It said approval. I said, I want to talk to you about my approval addiction. And I started drinking the apple juice in the surface. And I didn't clean it out as much as I should, so God forgive me for that. <laughs> I said, ooh, I feel good. No, I'm playing. I'm kidding. Come back. I drank the whole bottle. And I said, the challenge with approval is where do you go when the bottle's empty? Being addicted to approval is worse than being addicted to alcohol. Some people are addicted to the alcohol because of the addiction to the approval of other people just trying to get you to validate me and trying to get you to celebrate me and trying to get you to see me. I'm telling you, praise is a poison. Many of us have become addicted to, and all throughout, even the book of Acts, you will see the detriment of praise to people. You remember Ananias and Sapphira? They lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied about a field that they owned and they sold. They lied about the prophet. Why would you lie about what you sold it for? Because remember what happened? God started moving in the early church and people started getting generous as God started moving and they started selling things and everybody started bringing what they sold and nobody had a need at all. And Ananias and Sapphira saw the praise and the affirmation that people started getting because they were being generous and so they said I want some of that praise I want people to look at me and see me generous and because that praise got into their heart they lied to the Holy Spirit and dropped dead in the presence of the Lord because that's what happens when you become addicted to praise it's only a matter of time before the weight of the praise crushes you because you were not created to receive glory you were created to reflect glory I came to tell somebody today anytime somebody gives you praise don't receive it and when you do receive it just reflect it back to the God that made you the God that woke you up the God that kept your heart beating the God who is worthy of it and yet even Jesus was strategic when he moved in the earth and didn't even receive the praise of people the Bible says things like he knew what was in humanity he knew what was in them so he did not give himself to them. You know how many times they try to make him king and he whoosh, skirted out of the city and said, not yet, because of praise. And then, ooh, I got rejection. Rejection. Come on, y'all got more rejection than that. Come on, tell me everything you really wanted to say about me. He said tomato. <laughs> 
I started over there with the praise because I wanted to have the memory of the praise before I experienced the pain of rejection. This is the one that hurts so bad. Rejection. Make some noise, rejection. See, it's not even just the boo. It's who does the boo. Have you noticed? See, it's who rejects you that hurts the most. It's who you want. The, the pain is the person that you want the most approval from. The person who you know. I mean, come on. You don't mind being rejected by a dude you wasn't looking at? If you wasn't trying to holler, please reject me. Stalker, get away. It's the one that you saw and you're like, oh, I'm telling you, our kids, would, oh, we would make beautiful kids together and I could just see it. Oh, we would be, it, when he rejects you, that is who gives you the boo. That's what hurt. Re re the pain of rejection is so real. My daughter and I, she's eight, and we have something we started. We call our heart to hearts. So we, we, before she goes to bed, we have daddy, daughter, heart to heart. Uh, and, and what we ask is, what's something today that made your heart happy? And what's something today that made your heart sad? And we do that. I share mine, she shares hers. And do you know the thing that always makes her heart sad? It's, it's a different, different girl, different week. <sighs> Daddy made my heart sad. And Susie said she doesn't want to be my friend anymore. Next week, different girl. Daddy, what made my heart sad is Haley said she didn't want to be my friend today. So we were a different girl every time. And you know what I'm saying? Oh, forget Haley. You don't need Haley's affirmation. You're incredible. You're amazing, girl. Come on, you're Everly Madu. You're awesome. You know who your daddy is? <laughs> and it's so crazy how I'm like trying to tell her hurry up and just get over it. When I'm 38 years old and I still got some rejections playing in my mind that I ain't got over it. And I'm telling her, hey, just, just get over it. Because rejection, ooh, rejection has a way of sticking to you. It's funny how people respond, because that's what it is. It's your response to rejection. It's the response. Because the rejection is inevitable. It's how you respond to rejection. A lot of people, you respond by retaliation. I mean, people, oh, I'll show you who I am. I'll show you I'm somebody. In fact, some of the greatest atrocities we see in the world, in school sometimes, always happen from somebody retaliating to the rejection that they felt. Sometimes we retaliate. Sometimes we retreat. We retreat. And that's the saddest one of all. Because you allow the rejection of somebody in your past to stop you from missing out on the love that is right there in your present. Do you know how many people won't step into another church because it's easier to sit with your arms folded and say, I can't stand the church and church hurt. And they won't come to another church not realizing that God will heal your church hurt with the church. God will use the church to heal your church and there are no perfect churches. I'm not advocating you being spiritual abuse, but if every single church you go to, you find something wrong, I'm telling you, it might not be them, it might be you. Or it might just be you haven't understood the reality that humans are broken and everybody in some way, shape, or form is going to reject you. Somebody inadvertently is going to reject you, especially if your feelings are brittle and you sense it. Somebody's going, this is the problem with the praise of man and the rejection of man is that they're so fickle. One moment they'll scream Hosanna and the next moment they'll say crucify you. So you ought to stop looking at humanity to get the praise or get the rejection pain of rejection. The Bible is replete with people who were rejected. I could talk about anybody. I could talk about Joseph and how he was rejected by his own brothers. I could talk about David who was rejected first by his own father. Yes, Samuel came and poured the oil on David, but I wonder if the oil got caught in his tears because he was trying to figure out how come you didn't call me the first time when Samuel said, bring all your sons? How come I didn't get invited to the party? The pain of rejection. I could give you all kinds of people, but what about who? Jesus. 
Do you understand that our Savior was defined by rejection? In Isaiah 53, it says that he was despised and rejected by men. In John chapter 1, verse 11, it says that he came to his own and his own received him. Now, he lived on rejection. Every single place that he went, they rejected him. You would think they would have received the son of the living God, but they did not. Jesus was so familiar with rejection, so familiar with the rejection that he went into his hometown, his hometown of Nazareth, the place where he was born, the place he grew up rather. And in that hometown, it is the only town he could do no mighty work. Every other place he went, miracle after miracle, people being set free, people being delivered, but he comes to his hometown and the Bible says he can do no mighty work. How can the king of kings, how can God in flesh do no mighty work because he was in his hometown and his hometown was familiar with him and they rejected him. And sometimes it's the people that know you the most that reject you the most. Sometimes the greatest rejection you'll experience is from your own family. And he was fully acquainted with grief. I love it in Luke's gospel when he gets ready to send out the 72. He says, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Is that not the most discouraging pep talk you don't ever heard in your life? I mean, think about it. You're one of the 72. You're about to go out and preach. You're like, oh, here it goes, Jesus. We got you. This gospel's going to spread. I know you told us that the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few, but we got you, Jesus. Oh, you gave us authority to cast out demons. You gave us authority to heal the sick. Let's go. They had their partners. They sent them out two by two. And here they are about to hit these streets. He's like, oh, by the way, come back. Pep talk real quick. Sending you out as lambs among the wolves. I'm sending you out in an atmosphere of rejection. He takes it further and says, oh, by the way, when you go to a certain house, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off of your feet. In other words, expect to not be received when you go places. Expect to be rejected. But then he gives them the command and says, make sure you shake the dust off of your feet whenever you are rejected because he knows that rejection has the tendency to stick to you. The rejection will stay to you. So he says, as a sign of saying, I'm not going to let this rejection stop me, he said, shake the dust off your feet because they did not see the value of who you were and the value of what you carried. So as a sign to that house and that city, shake the dust off your feet and let that rejection actually become a redirection and reroute you into the place that you're called to now. In other words, keep it moving. I don't know who this message is before, but maybe you've been stuck and rejection has you hurt, but God's word for you today is shake it off and keep on moving. Just because they rejected you doesn't mean that your purpose is over. Just because they closed the door doesn't mean that God is done. I wish I had somebody in here that knew that my purpose does not stop just because you rejected me when greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I'm a child of God. The rejection, it hurts. The rejection is painful, but I can't allow the rejection to keep me stuck. Oh, I forgot to give you one of the responses to rejection. Another one is rehearsing where you keep putting it on repeat, what they did every single time. And that rejection on repeat that you keep rehearsing has you stuck. The text that I chose today, I'm gonna be honest with you, I've never heard anybody preach on. I've never heard anybody preach on the fact that after Jesus ascended to the heavens, and they were in the upper room before the Holy Spirit came down. You know, I'm Pentecostal. Everybody goes to the fire and the tongues. They just skip straight to chapter two. But nobody reads the scripture I read today where Peter called for a midterm election. And he said, I want Matthias, Ooh. Matthias, Matthias. And he said, I want justice, Joseph Barsabbas, but they call you justice, even though you got no justice. He said, I, we, we got we to gotta figure out who is going to take Judah's place. 
And before I even delve into that, which is painful, because how many know it feels good to be Matthias, to know that you were selected to be a part of the 12, horrible to be justice. <laughs> horrible to be justice. Keep in mind, this is the only time these two disciples are mentioned in your entire Bible. After that, we don't hear from them again. Why would the Holy Spirit take all of Acts chapter one to tell us about a midterm election where Judas was getting replaced about two dudes who are never gonna be mentioned in the Bible again? Why would Dr. Luke take the time to write that down? He must be trying to give us a message before the Holy Spirit comes down. He must be trying to give us a message before the church is birthed that if you're gonna be a disciple, you better learn how to deal with rejection of people and the praise of people and there are some seasons in your life that you will be Matthias and you will be celebrated and don't let the praise go to your head give the glory back to God and there will be some seasons in your life that you will be justice and you'll feel like you had an injustice but don't let that stop you from trusting God because sometimes the rejection is actually rerouting you somewhere else and it's how you deal with PR yeah. it matters why else are these two dudes in the story? Why else do I got them on stage the whole sermon? Because the Holy Spirit wanted them to understand that there will be times that you will get praise. And that praise cannot be your lifeline. It cannot be the thing that feeds your soul. And there will be times you will be rejected. And that rejection cannot cause such a wound that you never love again, that you never trust again. That you never believe again. Hold up. Wait a minute. Rewind. How did they get to the upper room to have this midterm election anyway? Don't forget what preceded this election. You know what preceded the election? Jesus defeated something. Jesus defeated something that nobody else could defeat. He defeated death. You know you are bad to the bone when you defeated death. I'm not talking about the Green Bay Packers who the Cowboys will defeat today. I'm not talking about the Philadelphia Eagles. But you know that you got it going on when you defeat death. Death, when you take the sting out of death, you know you got all power in your hand. When you come back from death, when everybody thought it was over, and you said, no, 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 don't you put a period, that's just a comma. He defeated death. See, some of y'all ain't shouting because you only wait till Easter to shout about resurrection. But can I tell you, the resurrection is something that revolutionizes our life every single day. I am so glad that death is not the end. I am so glad that it is not over until God says, is over. I am so glad that his resurrection is what caused me to go from death to life. That his resurrection is what gives me hope. That his resurrection is the reason that the pain and the suffering that I go through in earth is not the final story. I'm so glad that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall not all sleep, but we will be caught up to meet him. This is not the end of the story. I will be with him in glory. And the fact that I can have eternal life and life more abundant is because what he did when he died and he got up from the grave I need at least 15 of y'all who are thankful for the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to just give him some praise at the Toyota Music Factory thank God that he got up from that grave defeated death walked through the stone that was rolled away. And everybody shouts about the resurrection. And we shout about the resurrection. But don't forget, the disciples, they weren't expecting it. They were not expecting him to get up from the grave. As many times as he told them, just like he tells you a bunch of stuff that you keep forgetting about. They didn't believe it. Come on, y'all. If they really thought he was going to get up from the grave, they would have all been by the tomb talking about, yeah, dog, get ready, get ready, get ready. He coming, he coming. He told us, no, these jokers were in the house with the lights off talking about, come on, y'all, we got warrants. If they killed him, they going to kill us. <laughs> they weren't expecting it. They were not expecting it. They thought he was going to take over an earthly kingdom. They didn't get it. But when he came back, oh, I'm thankful for a savior who will come through walls to prove to you that what he spoke will come to pass. 
all the walls that you had up, he'll come through. You have to understand that when he died that day for the disciples, it was hope lost. But when he came back, it was hope restored. And they thought that since he's alive, surely he's going to stay on earth and get all the I know, you're tired, but I'll take it. But he didn't. Remember, nobody preaches about this either. And only Luke records it. As he was talking to them, after he gave them a commandment to go up to the room where they had the election, he ascends. No warning. They even ask, hey, glad you're back. Are you at this time gonna restore the kingdom of Israel? He says, that's none of your business, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon And he, I mean, come on, y'all. I don't know how you read the Bible. Imagine just talking to somebody. Yeah, man, I'm probably going to go to Chipotle after service, man. You know, I like, if in any other, no warning. And they're staying there, stuck, going, how? How can he leave? See, the ascension felt like rejection. Because I already lost you once. Now I'm losing you again? Oh, come on, you know in that moment they didn't realize the power of what was going to happen. That his earthly body was limited to one time and to one place. But now since he has ascended the Holy Spirit can come down and now this Jesus that was limited to one place who was just among you is now going to be in you oh we shout about it today but if you are a disciple the ascension felt like rejection when it wasn't rejection it was just a transition it was a transition from him doing the miracles for them to him doing the miracles through them. It was a transition for him always showing up for them to him showing power through. It was a transition. Who am I preaching to today? Some of you are dealing with the pain of the rejection and the rejection is not a rejection. It's just a transition. God is transitioning you into something better. They didn't understand the dunamis power that was about to come into that upper room. But I came to tell you, you don't understand the thing that God is about to take you to. And they, don't understand, they didn't understand that he was about to literally ghost them. He ghosted them. He just left. But I'm thankful that he ghosted them because we need the power of the Holy Ghost. I needed it. And he had to send two angels to say, what y'all doing? Look it up. This same Jesus you see today will return to you. Because if you're not careful, rejection will have you going. How did they divorce me? How did I lose the business? How did I not get into the university? Why did they reject my application? It'll have you stuck looking up. I know they had to be looking for a long time because he had to send two angels to say, what are y'all doing? Keep it moving. When you go through rejection, you've got to keep it moving. Otherwise, you'll be standing there looking up, waiting for something to happen that's not going to happen and missing out on the power of what's waiting for you in another room. I want to speak to the person that's stuck looking up and I got a deep word for you. Keep it moving. I know it hurt. You got to walk away. I'll give you the illustration he gave me. This illustration worth you coming to church. Sometimes you can be stuck in one spot instead of moving. My son, Robert Madhu III, one of the things I don't like doing is taking him to the bathroom in public because public bathrooms scare me and, and, and they're nasty. And so if I have to, I'm like, can you hold it? No, I'm like, oh. And 
I take him in, and of course I have this rule. Don't touch anything and every kid. <laughs> Stop. And we'll go. I'm like, don't touch anything. I'm making four shields out of toilet paper and stuff. It's so funny. We'll be in there. This happened multiple times. He'll finish handling his business. And then he'll be, ah, don't touch. And he's looking for a flush valve that ain't there. And I'm always having to tell him, son, leave it. All you got to do in this bathroom is walk away and wash your hands. Y'all missed it. Some of y'all have been stuck at a stinky place in life and you're standing there. Some of you got the nerve to be reaching out to things that actually hurt you, that they're trying to destroy you and you keep reaching. And God just told me to tell you at the Toyota Music Factory, if you're standing there and you're still reaching, the stink gonna be there too. Sometimes the rejection is a sign. I've just got to walk away and let God handle it and wash my hands and believe that the rejection is rerouting me. I wish I had somebody in here who knows what it's like to go through the pain of rejection but understands that the rejection doesn't mean my story is over. God is just rerouting me. He's just taking me somewhere. I dare you to get up on your feet and give him some praise in this place today. Don't let the praise go to your head. Don't let the rejection poison your heart. Maybe the reason the Holy Spirit let Justice and Matthias be in the story is to show us how you deal with a PR problem. If you get selected, don't let the praise puff you up. We weren't created to receive praise. We were created to reflect it. Don't let the rejection wound you so deeply that you never reach out again. Well, how do I handle it? You still ain't helped me. What do I do? See, we don't ever hear from them again. In fact, y'all can go. Your hands, his hands are shaking. Y'all can go. Can. We never hear from them again, just in that text. Never mind, I'm sorry. Come back, come back, come back, come back. I forgot something. I forgot something. Oh, my bad. I forgot something. I forgot something. I forgot who? I forgot how they got nominated. You remember how they got nominated? I, I think their nomination shows us how you deal with praise for man and rejection for man. Remember how these two, remember there was 120 up in that upper room? It's a lot of candidates. How come these two? It says in Acts chapter one, verse number 21. Can we look at it? This is how they got nominated. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living ooh, among us. Go back. Ooh, living. I'm, I'm glad it didn't say the whole time Lord Jesus was living and then put a comma because I'm, mean, you know, he died, but he got back up again and he was just living among us, but now he's about to be in us, living among us. So they had to be there the whole time Jesus was living among us. This is the qualifications. And then what's the next verse? Beginning from John's baptism to the time Jesus was taken up. You missed it. They couldn't be nominated unless they were with the disciples. Not the day he fed the fish of 5,000. Fish and loaves. Everybody was there that day. And they, not the day he raised Lazarus from the dead. You had to have been with them from John's Baptist, not even from Bethlehem, but just from John's Baptist, not even from 13 when he was in the temple, but just from when he was baptized by John. What happened when he was baptized by John? I'll tell you what happened when he was baptized by John. For the first time on earth, the whole Trinity made a cameo appearance because you had Jesus in the water with John. You had the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, and then you had the Heavenly Father who spoke a word over over his son and said this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased in other words you can handle praise and you can handle
under rejection as long as you ain't fixated on it. You got to be fixated on your acceptance and your approval from God. I'm not living for your cheers and I'm not hurt by your booze because I know I am his child. I am loved. I am accepted. And once you know that, you can handle all of it the way you handle the praise and the rejection is to be immersed in your acceptance from your heavenly father some of y'all been so caught up in the you're addicted to it checking your notifications because likes are your new narcotic <laughs> so hurt by the that you can't trust anybody and here's what I want you to do now y'all can leave for real you have to get quiet no for real y'all can leave can you stop playing I know it's gonna kill my mood but watch this I can't be caught up in the can't be caught up in the the way I can handle the pain of rejection and put the praise in perspective and reflect it back to him it's in a sign that you can't hear I wish God would give you an audible voice just like he gave Jesus but you might not get it but you have to quiet so deep See, there's another sign in here you can't hear. It's been here the whole time. See, back there in the back, I had them put a sign to remind me that I am loved and I am accepted by my Heavenly Father. Ooh, that sign was there the whole time I was preaching. And you even know it. Because as you go through life and you get the ah and the book, there's got to be a center that you come back to that reminds your soul, I am loved and accepted by my heavenly father. My daddy might have walked away on earth, but I am loved and accepted by my heavenly father. I hadn't had a date and they keep rejecting me, but I am loved and accepted by my heavenly father. And every time I would come over here and over here and some of y'all's faces that you can't see that look like you bored in the message, I kept looking at the silent sign to remind me I'm loved accepted by him.